All right, we are continuing the study on uh, pre-trib rapture scriptures throughout the Pauline epistles. This week, we are going to do 1 Thessalonians, the book of 1 Thessalonians. And you know, I went through that whole book, and I couldn't find one clear verse on the pre-trib rapture, especially in chapter 4. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> Had to do that, just to the post-tribbers, you know, just give them a little ray of hope. You know, so they can hang on to their heresy a little bit, you know. Uh, no, actually, uh, there are many verses which prove a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble. Catching away before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the real term. Let's start out here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You're going to need a King James Bible. If you have a Vatican version like the NIV, the ESV, the NASV, even the New King James Version, don't use it. It's not going to lead you into the truth. You need a King James Bible. Then you're going to see how relevant it is to today. It is not archaic. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace. There's that word again. If you've been watching the other ones, you know what I'm talking about. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now there's a couple points I need to make here. First of all, Keep your hand here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and go back to Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. I'm going to keep in mind that there might be somebody that came along and they're watching this one before they watch the other ones. So I need to make the point here again. Revelation chapter 6, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 there says, uh, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Peace. Peace. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. You say, wait a second, though. That's the world is taking away the peace. But a Christian can still have peace in spite of it. Oh, no, actually you can't. Because you see, if you go up to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And I saw one... Uh, when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. This is Jesus Christ that's releasing these things, these plagues on the earth. Taking away peace from the earth. But Paul, over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, says we're supposed to have peace. How can you have peace when Jesus Christ is just taken away from the world? That's a problem. Unless you are uh, pre-trib. Then it fits in perfectly. You see, because we are going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. All right? It's not a problem for us. So we can look and we can say, okay, when Paul says we're to have peace over here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, not a problem. We can have peace today. Revelation chapter 6 verse 4, we're not here. We've already left. We left in chapter 4. We've been called up. You see? Not a problem. Let's look at a couple other points here. To go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Patience of hope? Huh, what does that mean? Well, turn over to Titus chapter 2. You can keep your hand there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Titus chapter 2. Beginning in verse 11, Titus 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, sorry to the Calvinists out there, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live, turn the page, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have hope. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3? And patience of hope 
in our Lord Jesus Christ? You see, we are sealed until the day of redemption. I don't have to worry about losing my salvation because the mark of the beast shows up and I get tempted to take it because I want to provide for my wife and child. So I take the mark of the beast and, oh, I lost my salvation. No, I don't have to worry about that. I have patience of hope. And you see, it's interesting there too because that hope, the blessed hope that's spoken of over in Titus chapter 2, it's talking about the rapture. It's talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ. And they'll say, well, that means the second coming. No, it isn't. You look at the context of it, it's talking about when we go to be with Him. That's what it's talking about there. We're going to cover that here in a couple of weeks when we get to the book of Titus. We'll cover it in more detail. But the point is, our hope, there's a key to it. It's based upon patience, isn't it? Yeah. We have to have patience. You know, there have been many times I've wondered, what on earth is the Lord waiting for? I mean, the rapture should have happened a long time ago. But you know, a lot of you out there are very happy that it didn't. Because you've just been saved not too long ago. Praise the Lord that He's waited. But you know, for us that have been saved for a while and have been looking for the coming of the Lord, it takes patience sometimes. You know, sometimes I'm anxious to get out of here. Other times it's like, Lord blesses us and it's nice and, and you know, I enjoy life down here. Other times it's just like it gets so vexing. I'm going, okay, Lord, flip the switch. Let's get out of here. Patience of hope. And you know, a lot of people that go post-trib, they lose the patience of that hope. They quit looking for Jesus Christ. They take their eyes off of Jesus and they start to look at the world. That's why they go post-trib. And I'm thankful when I see people and they say, you know, I went post-trib for a while, but after seeing the arguments and, and everything from these sermons, I would go, I'm going back pre-trib. I'm looking for Jesus Christ now. I'm not looking for the Antichrist or the New World Order. I'm back to looking for Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to have, brethren. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. You're to know that you're saved as a Christian. Know that you have been elected. You've been saved, and therefore you are predestinated to go up. We're to know. But if you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, you don't know for sure. You have to endure to the end. It's not the same setup. Look at verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. It's an old hymn that says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We have a blessed assurance. We have a blessed hope knowing that our salvation is begins with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 there. It begins with that, and it ends with us getting caught up together. With the dead and living saints, we get caught up, and we meet Jesus Christ for the first time. That's our blessed assurance. We have that assurance. People in the time of Jacob's trouble don't have that assurance. They are facing God's wrath on almost a daily basis. You know, it's incredible that anybody could go post-trib and stay there and not ever hear the arguments for pre-trib again. Give me some, gives me some real questions about that person. But let's go down to verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. It says here, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turned to God from idols? Hmm. Can you do that today? Oh, sure. There's some very, very wicked people out there that have gotten saved. Satan worshipers, witches, all kinds of things like that. They turn from idols. What about the time of Jacob's trouble? Keep your hand there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and go over to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 14. It says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. This is talking about the false prophet that comes after the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. They made an image to the beast? Hmm. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be 
killed. Could you call that image an idol? Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting because we, you know, I've seen a lot of, of drawings and things like this. People have surmised over the years what this image is going to be, and they'll kind of make a statue of this guy that's going to be the Antichrist, and people have to worship the statue. And that could be. But how do you give life to a statue? Kind of weird. Uh, what, what would John think if he saw television? Large screen TVs. That's an image. And he wouldn't say, oh, he electrified it, and now we can see it, a satellite link up. He'd say he gave life to that image. Yeah, could be television. But I also saw that they're now doing this thing in Las Vegas where they actually have a hologram show up, 3D hologram. And you can have these guys, like I think it was Dean Martin or something, they had him singing at some Las Vegas event. It looks like him standing there singing. It's a 3D image that's projected. Is that what they're going to do? I don't know. But the point is, there's going to be worship of an image. Very interesting. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. You say, what happens if you worship that image? Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, I'll just say this, and I'm going to try to, to word my speech here as nicely as I possibly can. Um, there are some complete buffoon idiot morons out there, uh, I'm trying to be nice here, that are trying to debate this passage now. Well, you know, I can read Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11 and I don't really know if it says that whether or not you can take the mark and still be saved. <laughs> I'm going, what are you talking about? It's right there. There's no debate. This is, a, I mean, you can debate certain parts of Scripture. I'll grant you that. You can say, well, you know, what does this mean or what is that? There's no debating Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11. It's crystal clear. You have any part of that mark of the beast, worship the beast, take it, or, and his image, take the mark, you're in hell without any remedy, without any chance of getting out, without any, oh, I made a mistake or what? There's no debate here. There's no debate. You know, I came out and ripped on Ken Hovind because he comes in. I'm not really sure. I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. I'd have to study it. There's no study needed. Okay? He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Yes, I don't like to have to say that about a guy I used to respect very highly, but the fact of the matter is, if you can read that passage and come out, come out saying anything but it's definitely people go to hell. You come out saying, well, I'm not really sure. You're a liar. You can't be that blind. Okay? That's a deceiver. Very, very, very dangerous. But you see there, again, if they're worshiping the image, they go to hell. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, <coughs> now, excuse me. If the Pauline epistles can be applied to people that live in the time of Jacob's trouble, then they could turn from worshiping that image to serve God. How does that work? Again, contradicts Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11. <coughs> See, it doesn't work. Again, this is an another proof that what is written to us as Christians today, what Paul wrote to us, is not for people that are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. You can worship whatever you want today and turn from it and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and He will save you. That's not true in the time of Jacob's trouble. If you worship the image in the time of Jacob's trouble, you go to hell and you burn forever. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how many PhDs or THDs or THMs or whatever other nonsense they have behind their name. The text in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11 is crystal clear. Again, another scripture that proves a pre-trib rapture. Now let's go to verse 10. Here's another good one. We're there to turn from idols, you know, serve the living and true God. 
and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. <laughs> well, that means we get out halfway through it. We go through the first half because there's no wrath there. This stupid nonsense that these people teach. Well, the word wrath isn't specifically used, so therefore the Antichrist being unleashed and, and you know, by Jesus and, and war and, and famine and death and hell and, and, you know, the earth being completely wiped out and everything else, and, you know, and, and it, that's not wrath. <laughs> uh, what is it? Happy butterflies and sunshine? I mean, it's wrath. And you go back to Zephaniah chapter 3, it talks about his, God's assembling the kingdoms to pour upon them his indignation. That's the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. And by the way, if you take the mark, what do you get? God's wrath. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Read it. When does the mark show up? At the beginning, not halfway through. post servers just make a total wreck of the Bible. We are to wait for His Son from heaven. Not the Antichrist. Not the mark of the beast. Not the one world government and the Illuminati and the, the blah, blah, blah. We're not waiting for that stuff. The Antichrist cannot show up until we leave. You'll see that next week's study. Just incredible. Now I'll go to chapter 2, verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. It says here, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Okay? Now we're in context. Unbelieving Jews. Verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Still very true today. A lot of the lost Jews are very contrary to all men. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. I should really check my Greek text here. It can't really truly mean what it just said there. The wrath has come upon them. No, 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 no. The wrath comes upon the bride to purify the bride and to make her pure and white by God's wrath being poured out and judgment and things. You see, what is the time properly called? The time of Jacob's trouble. Israel. Jacob is Israel. Do you get it? Daniel's 70th week. 70 weeks are, upon, are determined upon thy people, Israel. This time is never called the tribulation or the great tribulation. Those are never titles. They're descriptions of the time that comes, but they're never given as titles. I say this over and over and over again. Post-tribbers still can't get it. I see these moron post-tribbers, fools, whatever you want to call them, and they get to the end of the thing and they go, you didn't prove one thing against the post-trib rapture. You're a liar. You're an absolute liar. These sermons, and it's not be, no glory to me, but these sermons, the Holy Ghost will reveal this stuff to you. It destroys the whole post-trib doctrine. Post-tribism, there's no excuse for it. There's none. If you are saved and you have the Holy Spirit that guides you into all truth, you will come out, quote-unquote, pre-trib. I've been over that, you know, argument before. You know, it's not actually the title, but let's just stick with it for the sake of these videos. I mean, how can you not? The Jews are contrary to all men. They, they've killed Jesus Christ. They put him to death. They refused him as their Messiah. What's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble? Signs and wonders. The Jews require a sign. God gives them seven years of signs and wonders to accept their, their Messiah finally. That's why back in the book of Zechariah, they're, they're weeping when they see him. Let's continue. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Hmm. 
Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? What is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? You know a crown of rejoicing is given to somebody that wins souls? When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, if you've won people to the Lord or helped to lead people to the Lord, you'll get a crown of rejoicing. And, and how is that crown of rejoicing? What, what is the tie in there? You get up to heaven and you see those people that, whose lives you've influenced. You see your brothers and sisters in Christ for the first time face to face. Not just the living today, but those that have gone on and died. Our heroes of the faith that have, that have lived before us. It's going to be a wonderful time. That's our hope. That's our joy. And when does it happen? At the end of seven years of God's wrath and most people are not going to survive it. <laughs> what? <laughs> ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, how are you going to feel? You get there to see Jesus Christ and stuff and he just puts you through seven years of hell on earth. You know, and literally, death and hell follow the pale horse rider. So I'm not swearing. It will be hell on earth. Death and hell come out. You know, incredible. You, Jesus just put you through seven years of that, and you get up there and you go, Jesus, hey, you know, my Savior, you know. I mean, most of the body of Christ didn't make it through there. They took the mark and were damned by you, and you had to break your promise, you know, as it says over in Ephesians chapter 1, but I'm happy to see you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Now it'll be like a wife coming up to her husband, and the, and the guy just beats her and smacks her across the grim, bam, kicks her and everything. You know, and the post rivers will laugh, oh, you know, we'll, we say Christ is not a wife beater, and they go, oh, that's so funny. They can't answer it. You know, husband's beating his wife up, and she goes, I sure do love him. You know, that's not love. That's perversion. That's sick. Something's wrong. Well, you would say that about people. Why wouldn't you say that about Jesus Christ and his bride? If you're a post tribber my beloved husband, my beloved is his, and, or I am, how's that song go? My beloved is mine and I am his, his banner over me is love. As I'm going through the tribulation, I'm going to die and take the mark and go to hell. <laughs> if you are still post-trib after you've seen all these things, get your dirty, stinking heart right with God, okay? Get down on your knees. You're probably not saved. If you're still post-trib and you've somehow managed to get through these videos and you've actually watched them all, you're not just a you know commenter. I watched the first five seconds and then I had to post my comments and then I didn't watch anymore because I've heard the arguments before. <laughs> I get that stuff. You people, I mean, I, I can just read you like a book. I've been dealing with post-tribbers for years and years and years, long before I was even on uh, YouTube here, even before I was in full-time ministry. So I know your arguments. They're all, they all fall apart. It's ridiculous. But let's continue. It's always fun, isn't it? Chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Wait a second. If... If we get caught up at the end of the tribulation, how does Jesus come back with us when we get caught up at the end? You know, I heard a guy say the one time, post-tribbers, they, they believe in a, a divine U-turn. You know, at the end of the, the tribulation, they're there on the earth and the Lord says, you few survivors, you know, come up hither. And they go, whoop. And he comes up and he goes, okay, get on your horses. Let's go back down. <laughs> you know, we get there and the Lord says, get on your horses. Time for the battle of Armageddon. We just got to get on your horse. Okay, here we go. Back down again. Where's the judgment seat of Christ at too, by the way? That's kind of interesting. They kind of conveniently push that out of the scene there. Very interesting there. But notice it says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. Now you say, wait a second there, that doesn't make any sense. If we get called up and things, how does it, how does it work out there? To the end and things like this? Verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. 
Stop right there. What happens at the rapture? I mean, when we come back at the coming of, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, are we like we are right now? Do we come back in the bodies that we have right now? No. At the rapture, we receive our incorruptible body. And then we're judged. That's when we become unblameable in holiness. We're going to be blameable at the judgment seat of Christ. I hate to tell you. I mean, there's no, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Sure, I understand that. You're not going to get there and the Lord's going to say, you know, upon reviewing your case here at the judgment seat, you really didn't work hard enough for me. i got to send you to hell. Sorry. You know, in spite of what Joey Faust teaches, that you go to hell for the millennial kingdom, you know. Part of the body of Christ is in hell. Parts, part is on the earth ruling and reigning with Christ. Yeah, okay. Don't listen to that nonsense. You know, will he spare the rod, I think, is the name of the book. Don't buy it. It's stupid. But when we get there at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to see everything that we did for the, for the Lord. It's going to be tried by fire. The Lord says, oh, you went out there and you passed out tracts and you witnessed and you did this and that. All right, I'm going to take those works and I'm going to put them here into the fire. It's going to be tried by fire. If it was actually done for your flesh, if you were trying to do it out of pride and say, I'm a soul winner, I've won thousands to the Lord, it's going to burn up. I've talked about that. You can see my Judgment Seat of Christ study for more information on that. It's an old audio sermon I did years and years ago. But when you do things for the Lord, when you say, hey, I'm going to do this for the Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to defend His Word, I'm going to try to win souls to Jesus Christ the real way, not easy believism, and you're doing things for the Lord, that stuff goes through the fire and it comes out purified. And those are your rewards. So what happens there is, in the end, to, there, to the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. There isn't going to be any strife or division or contention when we come back with Jesus Christ. At the end of the verse there. Coming, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. There isn't going to be Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Calvinists and Arminians. and Uh-uh, no, no, there's not going to be that there. We will be established at that point in time. We'll have our incorruptible bodies and we'll have gone through the judgment seat of Christ. All of our issues are going to be ironed out. We're all going to think like Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about that. But how do you work that stuff out if you believe that uh, we go through the tribulation and get raptured at the end? Whoop, boom, back down again. <laughs> no judgment seat. Boom. Uh huh. You might get an incorruptible body if there's enough time before the Battle of Armageddon, but there's no time to judge. You know, there's no time to judge our our lives down here. Doesn't work. It only works if you believe in the catching away before the time of Jacob's trouble. Pretty incredible. Next, we're going to go to chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. It says here, And that ye st uh, study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Now, if Paul is given some instruction for people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble, we have another problem. Why? Study to be quiet, do your own business, work with your own hands so you can stay in business during the time of Jacob's trouble? No man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. How's it going to work? Oh, I guess they'll make exceptions, religious ex exemptions, you know, for, for you. If you are a time of Jacob's trouble saint, you'll say, I'm going to be in business, but I'm going to have to do my transactions through silver and gold or something like this. Uh, no, you're not going to be in business in that time. And how about verse 12? That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. You're going to walk honestly in the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, if these verses are for people that go into the time, how are you going to walk honestly? You see the problem? I mean, back to Nazi Germany. Do you have, are you hiding any Jews in your house here? Yes, they're in the attic. Here's the keys. Go get them. <laughs> no, you lie to them. Why? You're deceiving the deceiver. These Nazis come, they're, they're just dripping with blood, and they're going, I want to take them off to the camps and torture them to death. 
you have any Jews here? You don't go, yes. You say, Jews? Oh, no, 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 sorry. Uh Uh-uh, nope. And that's Nazi Germany. We're talking about a worldwide Antichrist-run kingdom. You're not going to be able to be honest to those people in that time. You see people with the mark of the beast and whatever else, and the people that are here on the earth, I'm not going to be here, thank you, but uh, the people that are here on the earth, they can't be honest to them. You know? Wear a nice big hood over your forehead or something, or a winter hat over your forehead so people can't see. Because I do believe Revelation chapter 20 talks about a mark upon the forehead. I do believe in the implantable microchip thing, but I think there will be a mark upon the forehead too. You're going to have to cover that, your forehead up. You can't be honest to the people in that time of Jacob's trouble. So how would these verses apply to you as a Christian if Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, I'm beginning to think that we don't go through it. Maybe, just maybe. Continuing. Go to verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, post-ribbers, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We're going to meet them. We're going to meet the dead saints, living saints and dead saints. I've talked about this over and over and over again. It's all through the Pauline epistles, even in the book of John, with Lazarus coming up from the dead and things. It's amazing. But yet you look at Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, there's not one mention of dead saints coming up. Not one. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Only two times does this word trump show up. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Never in the Gospels. And again, I'm not going to go into the whole thing there, but you study the trump of God. The trump is the voice of the trumpet. That's what it means. It does not say the trumpet of God. And that's very significant, you see, because if you read over in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John hears a voice, as it were a trumpet, talking with him, which says, come up hither, and he goes up. That's what's going on there. With the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, the rapture is three things. I have it here. It's a comforting comforting hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, just read it. It's a blessed hope, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we read that earlier. And it is a purifying hope, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. All three of those things, it's a hope to us. We can have peace knowing that our Lord and our Savior is not going to pour out His wrath and His judgment upon us. I mean, how on earth could I comfort you in saying, they got the death camp set up and doesn't look good. They're about ready to kick in martial law here in America. The economy is going to collapse and we're going to go to camps and we're going to have our heads cut off. And, and uh, some of you are going to take the mark and you're going to face God's wrath. and You're going to understand that when he says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise that God actually lied to you. <laughs> How is that a comforting hope? It's not comforting. You know what's a comforting hope? Whatever sickness you are going through, whatever financial problems you are going through, whatever family problems, whatever job problems, whatever, whatever, it's all going to be over one of these days. Like that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you're not looking in towards heaven and seeing the sun being dark and the moon being turned to blood, the stars falling from heaven, and you go, oh boy, here it comes. There's nothing there like that. You read the Pauline epistles, that doesn't appear anywhere. We just read right there, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Where does it say anything about these signs in Matthew 24? They're not there. You know why? It's not the same event. It's not two different accounts of the same event. It's a different event in 1 Thessalonians 4. And all post-tribbers, all post-tribbers 
have to use Matthew 24 every single time. They all do it. Don't fall for it. Continue to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So, what's Paul saying? He is saying the timing of the rapture and the second coming are both a mystery. Paul's going, you have no need that I write unto you. You know that the coming of the Lord there, the second coming, in context there, that day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. You're not going to know when it's, it's going to happen. You're not going to know when the rapture is going to happen. In spite of some of the brethren that are continually trying to set dates. Okay? Well, I saw you know, a Hollywood movie and they had the, the, the date September 23rd, 2015 in it. And that's probably, they, know the rapture, they don't know the rapture. Oh, but they're the Illuminati. And you think that they have a better connection to the Lord than you do? <laughs> no. If the Lord hasn't revealed it to us, he ain't going to reveal it to a bunch of perverts out in Hollywood or a bunch of stupid Jesuits or the Pope or somebody else. They don't have a better connection to the Lord than we do. You don't need to know the day. All you need to know is we have a comforting hope. We can look for it with patience. We know our job is to witness to the lost world. Now let's go to verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3. And we're going to read down to verse 11. And I've talked about this for many, many years now. Look at the distinctions between the two groups, between the saved and the lost. Verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Somebody's escaping this time? Well, yes, that'd be us as Christians. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So we don't know the exact day when it's going to happen, but we aren't supposed to be in darkness either going, la, 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 you know, the world's getting better, things are wonderful, everything's just great and everything. Rapture? Oh, no, that's not going to happen in my lifetime. No, we're not supposed to be like that. We're not, see, moderation, you know, it's a very important thing with Christians. We're not supposed to be just, oh, who cares, whenever, you know, oh, it's, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, like that. We're not supposed to be that. We're not supposed to be date setters either. That's what Paul is saying here. We're to always abound in the work of the Lord. Verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. I try to do that. I know a lot of you try to do that as well. You see some kind of a significant prophetic event happening. Some city bank coming out and saying we're going to start to use biometric uh, ATMs or something like this this year, 2016, or you see some this or that prophetic updates and you go, wow, we're getting closer. You're watching and you're being sober. You know what sober is? Sober is saying, I'm not going to go with the partying and with the, the course of the world. I'm going to be sober. You know, like a designated driver, so to speak. Everybody goes to the, the bar there and stuff like this, and I'm not advocating anybody goes to the bar. I've never even been in one. But the point is you go, and everybody's having a good old time, and the, the designated driver's sitting there going, I'm not going to be parked. I'm not going to partake of any of this stuff. Why? i got to drive home later. I'm going to be driving a bunch of drunks home. i got to make sure that they get home safely. Well, brethren, <laughs> this world is drunk. This world is like a giant nightclub. And we as Christians have to be in it watching and being sober. I'm not going to be part of that. I'm not going to watch that television. I'm not going to listen to that music. I'm not going to eat that kind of junk food. I'm not going to this. I'm not going to that. Be sober. Elsewhere it tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Interesting. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken... There you go, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. You see it again. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. You know, that's an interesting thing. Why, what is the purpose of wearing a helmet? Because you can't really survive a headshot too well. Okay? And, it, you know, 
in biblical terminology here. I mean, you might have a guy, I heard of one guy, uh, Colonel James Bo Gritz the one time, he was actually in Vietnam, he was a Green Beret commander. Later on they made the Rambo movies after him, he was a pretty phenomenal soldier. But he turned at one point in time and a bullet actually glanced off the back of his head during a really heated battle. All right? So you can, you know, there can be times, uh, my father actually knew a guy, I used to work with him, that a bullet, he was in World War II during the D-Day invasion, and he stuck his head up, and a bullet went in here, and it was a metal helmet that he had on, and the bullet spun around inside of the helmet and never touched his head. You know, and he had the helmet to prove it. You know, and he said, he, you know, he lost his hearing for a couple days or whatever because of that, but he, you know, was so loud, but, you know, thing went inside like that. But let's go with the context here, you know, the first century. Um, you get a guy coming at you with a sword, and you take a hit in your head someplace with a sword, it's going to leave a mark, <laughs> you know, pretty good mark. That's why you wear a helmet. Well, in an interesting way, if you think about this from a spiritual perspective, if you don't have the helmet there, the hope of salvation... And it just doesn't mean, oh, yeah, I got saved back on such and such day. No, the hope of our salvation, the purchased redemption there, the, the, um, you know, the thing in Ephesians chapter 1 where it talks about that, you know, th that we're eventually going to be saved from this earth as well. We have that hope of salvation. You keep that in your mind, and guess what? It'll protect your head from getting messed up. That hope of salvation is on your head. Hey, I'm saved. I'm not going to be part of that. I'm going to be sober. No, no, thank you. Uh, you're going to go through the tribulation. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm saved. No, I don't need to worry about that stuff. No, sorry, get away. It'll keep you from getting messed up. If you keep that hope of salvation, hope of understanding, I'm saved now, but my redemption of the purchased possession, that's coming in the future at the rapture. Interesting. Verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, you get that? Living or dead in Christ, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Comforting hope. Why do you think I do these studies? Why do you think I do this? You know why? Because I know a lot of you out there are going through some really hard times. Women married to lost husbands. Husbands married to lost wives. Family members turning against you. Job problems, health problems, all kinds of stuff. I'm trying to comfort you. What comfort does uh, Ken Hoven have for his viewers? What comfort does Steven Anderson have for his? Or any other post-trib liar? They have none. None. They'll lie to you. You know, they'll, you know, kind of really deceive you and things like that. I mean, if those guys really believed that they were going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, if they really truly understood the full ramifications of that, they'd be crazy. I'd be crazy. I'm about to face God's wrath and judgment. It's a problem. And again, that's why verse 9 there is why they try to split the wrath towards the later half of the thing. Or if you get into Ken Hovind's system, it's like this little time period at the end of his seven years. It's like it goes into the millennial kingdom. So Jesus doesn't really rule for 1,000 years. It's only 997 and so many odd messed up. And they'll mess you up if you listen to them and take them seriously. Now let's go to verse 14. Verse 14. Now these verses here, uh, these verses are not so much proving that there's a pre-trib rapture and things like that and disproving the post-trib, but I just wanted to read these verses in conclusion of this sermon um, just as an encouragement, as an exhortation to you out there. Let's read these. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, exhort, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Let me just stop there real quickly. Verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. 
You know when people make fun of you as a Christian? And when they put you down and they tell you, I don't want anything to do with your stupid beliefs and whatever else. You don't have to go up to them and punch them in the face or something or, or render evil to that person. You know why? They're about ready to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. If people want to reject Jesus Christ, if they don't want to get saved right now, they're going to be living a nightmare soon. Probably in the next, sometime within the next couple years. Their life is going to be a nightmare. You don't need to render evil for evil. Vengeance belongs to God. He'll take care of it. Oh, believe me, He'll take care of it. And you know, my wife and I have had this discussion many times. I believe, because we've had times, you know, you will have people, we have bumper stickers all over our vehicles, you know, witnessing types of things. And there will be times people just kind of stay behind you and they just kind of ignore the bumper stickers. You know, they kind of ignore the gospel, in other words. That's wrong. It's wicked. But then you get these people that can't stand to even be behind the vehicle. And they'll go flying out around us and stuff. We were just uh, driving uh, last week, I think it was, and uh, there was a. It was like snowing. I mean, the roads were really, really slippery. It was. It had been raining, and it turned over to snow, and it was really kind of slushy, kind of slippery. And this guy was behind us, and you know we're doing like just five miles an hour under the speed limit, and you know we have all-wheel drive and stuff on our vehicle, and it was still slippery. And this guy goes flying out. I mean, he's behind me for a while, and he goes out around any slippery road conditions. And then he's like just disappearing. Must have been doing 70 miles an hour. Why? Didn't like the gospel. And you know, I believe somebody like that, God has special plans for them in the time of Jacob's trouble. These people that reject Jesus Christ right now, like we read about there earlier with the Jews, they're contrary to all men. They please not God. Therefore, wherefore the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. You know, there's a lot of really, really cocky Jews out there. A lot of these rabbis, they are just wicked, wicked devils. They hate Jesus Christ. They can't even stand the thought of somebody having to die to pay for their sins. They hate that. You know what's going to happen? God's wrath is coming upon them to the uttermost. And I don't wish that on anybody. But I believe those men are going to watch their wives be raped. Probably their children too. Horrible things. You see, Jesus Christ came and He, God loved us enough to give us His Son and whosoever will, let Him come. Come and be saved. Jesus, meek and mild like a lamb. But He comes back as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. No more Mr. Nice Guy. If you miss the rapture, if you're Jewish and you're watching me and you're like, ah, it's stupid stuff, you better take heed. You better take heed to my warning. Because God's wrath is coming and it is going to be more horrifying than anything that's ever happened on this earth. You are going to wish, if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to wish that you could have died in the Holocaust. Because it would be mild compared to what's coming. The time of Jacob's trouble is for a world that has rejected Jesus Christ. That's the reason for it. Don't give me this nonsense that the bride's going to go through it. Uh-uh. We're leaving. Continue. Verse fifth, or excuse me, verse sixteen. Rejoice evermore. Praise the Lord. We can if you're pre-trib. Pray without ceasing. It's very important. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Also very important for a Christian. Thank the Lord for what He's given you, both good and bad. Verse nineteen. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Be sober, you know. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's also very important. There's nothing wrong with giving prophetic updates and, hey, this is coming and that's happening and blah, blah, blah. But be very careful when you're publishing that evil. I see a lot of that among the brethren. You know, they'll say, oh, there's some kind of a thing. And I have to struggle with that too, okay. You know, there's some kind of a sodomite rally or something like that and they show pictures of it. Don't show pictures of that. Okay, that stuff is evil. It's the appearance of evil, and we're supposed to abstain from that. 
Oh, Bruce Jenner just changed himself into a woman. I don't need to see pictures of it. Why? It's evil, and we're to abstain from the appearance of that. Please keep that in mind. Verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Is Jesus faithful to you? Yes. Are you faithful to Jesus? Not always. There are many times that we'll fail the Lord. But there's one thing that you never have to worry about, and that is Jesus being faithful to you. He promised us that we're sealed under the day of redemption. But if he lied, then he'd be unfaithful. Our husband that's up there in heaven waiting for that time when the bride is complete, when we get called up, he's faithful. He never stepped out on us once, nor will he ever. He never had a negative thought towards us, of bitterness or something towards us. He's never once lusted after Mystery Babylon. <laughs> you know, why would he? <laughs> you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful. We're not going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. He's a faithful husband. The marriage of the Lamb. We're going to go there. He's not going to lose part of the body of Christ, part of the bride. He's not going to lose part of it. Verse 26, brethren, pray for us. Can I give that advice to anybody out there? Brethren, pray for us. Pray for my wife and I. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Just did. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the great and precious promises of your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to us. We don't have to worry about it. We don't even have to concern ourselves with having to stockpile food for seven years of your wrath and your judgment. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation because we made a mistake and took the mark. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff, Lord. Uh, all we got to think about is just doing work for you. After we're saved, Lord, we just work for you. And you'll reward us if we're doing it for your glory, Lord. If we're doing it for our own uh, selfish ends, then we, we won't get rewards. But Lord, if, you're, if you are the focus of our lives and we want to just serve you with our lives, uh, you're going to reward us for that, Lord. And I thank you for those promises. But Lord, if there's anybody right now that's listening to this study that believes that they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, if they are saved, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them of this heresy that they've fallen for, that uh, they would really seek the truth on this issue and that they would see that it is a catching away before the time of Jacob's trouble. And Lord, if there's somebody that's not saved, if there's a Jew that's watching this and wondering, what is it that these weird Christians believe? Lord, I, I hope and pray that they would really truly study uh, the books of John and Romans, pick up a King James Bible someplace and read those books for themselves and see if you are uh, anti-Jewish or something like this, Lord, that, that many Jews have lied to other Jews and said that uh, the Bible, the New Testament, is, is an anti-Jewish book. It's not. It's very promotional of the Jewish people. And Lord, I pray that they would get saved before this time of Jacob's trouble, before they have to see your wrath come upon them to the uttermost. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that is going to be it for First Thessalonians. How can you still believe in a post-trib rapture? I mean, you know, I'm going through this study and I'm just like, you know, I've been fighting this thing more than any other issue. I've been fighting this post-tribism stuff for so many years. And, you know, I've heard every single argument and I've answered every single argument. And uh, by God's grace, I'm, you know, no glory to me. But it's just like, they still come out with it. And they still say, you haven't convinced me of anything. And I'm just going, <laughs> you know, I'm, as I'm going through the study, it's like, oh, wow, I never saw that one before. Wow, I never used this argument before. I mean, it's right there. It's plain as day. God's wrath comes upon the Jews. It's right there. The time of Jacob's trouble. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, Israel. <laughs> I'm still not convinced. 
God help you. <laughs> You're still not convinced. <sighs> so that's going to be it for this week. Uh, we will see you next week in 2 Thessalonians. And we'll show you even more scriptures that prove that the rapture is going to be happening before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.